Tēnā koutou katoa and hello everybody. Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. My name is Ben Adelberg and I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland. Tēnē kamihi ke te mana whenua o Aotearoa and we acknowledge the local tribal authorities of New Zealand. And g'day, I'm Emma Strutt and I'm currently coming to you from Durrambul country in Queensland. Before we dive into our conversation today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And finally, if you enjoy this podcast, please like, share or comment on our social media and consider buying us a coffee to help support our work. Now on with the show. As most of our listeners will know, I spend a lot of time in the outdoors and through the Lentil Intervention, as well as my own coaching business, Kaitiaki Endurance Sports, we promote Athletes for Nature, a movement of outdoor enthusiasts that not only appreciate the importance of nature, but also take action to protect it. Uh, Earlier last year, through our socials, we also promoted the vast health benefits of immersing in nature. And we'll dive into those with with, uh, our chat a little later on. So we are super stoked to have an expert that will help us connect the dots between personal well-being and our biodiversity. That's right. So Dr. Emily Flyers is an award-winning science communicator, currently a research fellow and lecturer at the University of Tasmania, where she coordinates the Backyard Biodiversity Online Unit, which I can personally say is fantastic, and co-leads the UTAS Healthy Landscapes Research Group. With extensive experience as a health ecologist, Emily blends field, molecular and statistical techniques to understand how the environment shapes human health, in particular the health benefits of engaging with biodiverse natural environments. So lots to talk about today. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Emma and Ben. So Emily, as always, we like to start with a backstory uh, for you in particular, your keen interest in human beings and nature, how did that come about? (laughs) I mean, to me, it feels like those are just two of the most interesting things in the world. I think all of us find humans innately interesting um, as humans. But for me, let's see, I started, um, so I'm from upstate New York, um, not from Tasmania, where I currently live, I'm home with the Palo Apacana people, who I'd also like to acknowledge as traditional owners. Um, so I'm from, from upstate New York. That's where I was born and raised. I did my first undergraduate degree um, at the University of Buffalo. Um, people might have heard of Buffalo because it occasionally gets like two meters of snow in these winter snow dumps. Um, it's a It's a fantastic place to live. And I, in my undergraduate time, had the had the incredible luxury of having really supportive parents who just wanted me to, you know, find what I was interested in and study, study what I found interesting. Um, So I I spent some time that first year just figuring out which classes looked exciting and writing them all down and um, trying to figure out what majors that would lead to. And I got to take some incredible classes like um, comparative primate anatomy and psychobiology of sex um, and <laughs> understanding people's, I found those, those classes really interesting where we're understanding humanity and both from a psychological and an evolutionary standpoint. So the degrees that that led to was um, a dual major in anthropology and psychology. And, you know, so I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts with that degree um, and quickly realized that there were no job postings for psychological anthropologists or anthropological psychologists. <laughs> um, no one was really looking for my particular skill set at that time. Um, So, so I taught outdoor education for a couple of years. So growing up, I always spent a lot of time outside. My family always went camping when we traveled places. Um, We didn't tend to stay in hotels. We stayed in tents. Um, And there's probably practical and philosophical reasons for that. But um, yeah, I always spent a lot of time outside and I really enjoyed that. Um, So I, yeah, I taught outdoor education for a couple of years and took um, kids from New York City, mostly, and from Long Island school groups out into the forests of upstate New York and taught them about trees and ponds and wildlife and, you know, made campfires and cooked, burnt a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs over them and (laughs) um, did ridiculous campfire nights where we'd sing songs for for the campers and do all those sorts of fun things. 
Um, and I really, you know, there were aspects of that work that I really enjoyed. I, I could see sort of that transformational experience that that um, it was for the campers, for the um, teenagers that would come out there. Um, it also paid terribly. It's a, it's a terrible paying job. You know, it's you get you get lodging, free room and board, and then like a little bit of spare change in your pocket. So it wasn't exactly a career that I could um, stick with, I felt. But it did get me, you know, thinking more about what I enjoyed and what I liked about that. Um, so during that time, uh, well, Ben, you mentioned that you're into endurance sports. I did take up running at that point. I'd always um, done sports in, in school, you know, organized sports, soccer and lacrosse. But when I was out of university, I, you know, didn't have access to, to that outlet. And so just had to, you know, just run by myself, long roads sometimes, <laughs> um, which, which also has, has now become a lifelong thing and is one of the ways that I connect with nature and, and choose to choose to experience nature these days. But um, we can come back to that later. So yeah, so I, in teaching outdoor education, realized the impact that that had for me being out there and for, for the, the students and campers that came out. So I decided to um, take some, some further studies. So I did a, a experiential class in Costa Rica on, on primate behavior. So the ecology, behavioral ecology of primates um, and you know, spent some time learning Spanish while I was there. Um, and through that met a researcher that the teacher of that, that course was doing her PhD at the time, um, understanding the behavioral ecology of primates in Bolivia and South America. And, um, I got along well with her and loved being out there observing animals and looking at what they were doing and recording it and trying to understand it. So I worked on her research project with her in Bolivia for a couple of months, and that was, um, comparing the behaviors of Bolivian gray titi monkeys in a pristine forest and in another, um, more degraded forest and looking at the impact that that had on the, the impact of environmental quality was having on those. Um, primates. Uh, part of that project was collecting their feces. So I would, you know, walk around and observe these monkeys up in the trees and write down what they were doing and try to avoid getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and getting malaria and dengue. Um, I did one time, I would, you know, at one time I started keeping track of how many mosquitoes I killed in a day and I got up into the 300s. <laughs> so there was a, a lot of mosquitoes. Anyway, um, and which also got me thinking about parasites and, and pathogens. And collecting the, the feces of these monkeys was to look at their parasite loads. So, so the project was comparing, um, yeah, how many parasites they were infected with. And you could count the eggs from the uh, gut parasites, how, how many eggs there were in their feces to understand that um, parasite load. And comparing that between the different habitats and seeing how environmental degradation impacted um, the health of the primates. So I was thinking about these, these connections between environmental quality and the well-being of the animals living there and the well-being of the people in that landscape, getting um, exposed to parasites, picking up feces, and also getting exposed to um, mosquitoes and the parasites that they, they carry as well. So I decided to go back to university and try to understand those relationships better. So I did a master's degree at Michigan State University um, where I studied disease ecology and explored the um, a tick-borne bacteria that was emerging in the U.S. at that time called Anaplasma phagocytophilum. And I wanted to know whether birds were capable reservoirs of that bacteria. So um, yeah, so with these infections that are transmitted between animals and humans, they're called zoonotic infectious diseases. Um, animals can be called can be called a reservoir host if they can um, amplify that parasite or pathogen, if it can live in them and they can pass it on. So if they're contributing to that pathogen um, cycle, they're called a reservoir host. So I wanted to see if birds were doing that because that's one way that infectious diseases can move around the landscape. So migratory birds obviously can bring ticks and their infections long distances and can be contributing to the expansion of that um, infectious disease. 
And I also wanted to know if it was impacting the health of the birds. So um, we, at that time, um, you know, the, the emergence of West Nile virus in the U.S. was still um, fresh in people's minds. And that, that novel disease uh, really impacted bird populations, especially, especially corvids, so crows and blue jays and those related species. Um, yeah, it had, had a really high mortality rate for them. So we, I wanted to know if this other emerging infectious disease was um, going to potentially impact avian conservation and bird conservation in the U.S. So that's what my master's project was on. And, you know, following this, this thread of understanding the relationships between the environment and animal health and, and people's health, um, because those zoonotic diseases that we share are, are one really clear link between those things. So I studied that for my master's. Um, it wasn't the world's most exciting thesis in the end. It was luckily, very happily, um, birds don't, they're not capable reservoirs, so they can be exposed to the bacteria. They, they never um, pick it up in their blood system and they don't pass it on to other feeding ticks. So after lots of capturing birds and testing birds and collecting blood samples and bringing some back to the lab and exposing them to ticks and then exposing them to to uninfected ticks, first infected ticks and then uninfected ticks and, and observing their behavior and their um, temperature and body fat and body condition and all of these things, um, there's basically no change. So they're, they're very resilient, the birds were, to that infection, which was, which was exciting um, news for the birds, but not the most exciting thesis. Uh, and then I, but I found that that system, that way of, um, people and environment and animals being connected. It's one term for that is one health, that um, we all share a health. I found that really interesting and, and wanted to continue in that vein. So um, I moved to Australia, as you do, to do a PhD in um, still in disease ecology and epidemiology. I, I went to University of South Australia in Adelaide and explored Ross River virus and that disease system. And, um, both the transmission dynamics of that uh, mosquito-borne zoonotic disease and also the epidemiology. So where, where are people infected across the landscape? And part of that, um, part of my thesis was wanting to understand both the role of biodiversity in the transmission dynamics. Does it have a, is it, are areas that are more biodiverse having more of that infection in the landscape or less of that infection in the landscape and, and and wanting to understand human behavior and the role of human behavior in in getting infected with ross river virus um so that's that's what brought me to australia and you know sort of my um the path the study pathway to understanding uh, the connections between humans and environment and animals um i then moved to to tasmania so my partner works on Tasmanian devil facial tumor. He's a immunologist and is developing, a, working on a vaccine for that um, fascinating infectious disease of animals. And, um, you know, Tasmania is kind of the best place in the world to work on Tasmanian devil facial tumor. So we moved to Tassie and, um, you know, while, I, while I've always really appreciated, you know, and, and found fascinating transmission dynamics, um, and zoonotic infectious diseases, there aren't many in Tasmania, which is one of the many wonderful things about living in Tassie, um, is that we really, we don't have much in the way of infectious diseases or um, vector-borne anyway, mosquito and tick-borne infectious diseases. Um, so that's part of the reason I changed tack a little bit and started thinking about, um, you know, yeah, what are the benefits of us engaging with nature and and uh, and biodiversity and so i've continued more in that that vein that was a very long-winded answer to your question i think but what a journey <laughs> honestly and there's one thing i do want to ask um you are the founder of inspiring women in stem yes yeah please tell us a little bit more about that sure um so yeah i feel like just i don't know why because i've been raised this way that we all have a duty to give back to humanity and to the world and to you know do good things when and where we can um the way that i've done that in the last decade or so um one is through through my research that's you know i, I try to study things that i think matter in the world and could do some good in the world and so that's part of why i really like understanding the link between human well-being and environmental 
equality and, and biodiversity. Um, the other, the other way that I've gone about that is, is through science. So I, I think that science has a role in supporting um, healthy communities and, um, and wanting there to be equitable access to, to scientific information. So when I was living in Adelaide, my partner and I started something called Science in the Pub, where we would every month host an event in the pub um, and we'd bring scientists on a given topic. Um, yeah to that relaxed setting and, and have them each do short TED talk style presentations so that people could hear from the scientists who live in their community, who are doing research in their community and, and be in that really um, relaxed setting um, outside of the, the ivory towers of academia and connect with um, knowledge that way and, and feel comfortable to ask questions and, and learn. So that um, was sort of the first step to, to doing, um, yeah, to, to giving back in a way that sort of felt like it, it fit my, um, my strengths and my skills and, and what I was um, able to give at that time. So that, that actually is still ongoing, that Science in the Pub Adelaide, and they continue to do those events and, and hopefully um, continue to contribute you know, positively to society that way. When, when my partner and I moved to Tassie, we started up a Science in the Pub Tasmania same thing and and there's there's other models of of this sort of approach um cafe scientifiques and and pub science and stuff around the world um but there wasn't one in in adelaide and there wasn't one in tassie when we came so so we started one here and that's that's still ongoing running hosting those monthly events um my partner and i won a vice chancellor's award for that um, outreach and engagement work in 2018 i think um and that came with a small pocket of funding, four thousand um, dollars, to put towards our professional development. Um, but we wanted to put that towards, um, yeah, put that to good use. So some of it went back into the science in the pub um, series and and to improving, you know, that that event, those events. And then some of it I wanted to put towards supporting some of the incredible women that I met doing science degrees um you know that there was there was one one woman doing a phd in my department in biological sciences at the time from kenya who had um you know had a little boy and or had, was had a partner came here and was doing a phd um and and was pregnant and then went back and had her little boy and then her sister took care of him so she could come back and finish off her phd um and i just you know, I met some people who who really were facing uphill battles to um, to study science and to do a PhD. And so I thought we could do something to support them. Um, so I put some of the funding that we got towards starting this Inspiring Women in STEM program, which um, provides a little pot of money so that some women, we've been able to host three or four women each year, um, so that they can return to their community where, wherever it is and connect with youth in their community uh, and, and talk to them about the science that they're doing, about their journey to get there, about how they've overcome any, any obstacles or barriers that they have. And so the idea is for it to um, contribute both to that, that PhD student's um, career trajectory. So it's a good, um, great CV builder for them to, to have that engagement um, to, and, and to be a visible um, role model and mentor in, in their communities. So it contributes to the youth in their community as well. Uh, and yeah, it lifts, lifts their profile and um, we connect them with some coaching, some mentoring services, well, mentoring throughout the year. Um, local mentors and coaches help them hone their science story that they can share both with the youth in their community and more broadly. So we host some live events for them. We connect them with some media opportunities and we give them some training in how to um, maximize those media opportunities. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, going on our fourth cohort now. And every single year, I'm just amazed by these, um, yeah, these incredible women. So it's inspiring for me. That's why I keep doing Amazing. it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so we better get on to the nitty and gritty then. Mm. Um, we know that human health benefits and biodiverse environments are particularly a jam and we'll definitely sink our teeth into that in a little bit. Um, but just as a starting point, generally, how important is 
biodiversity when it comes to our ecosystems and then you know the flow on effects to the ecosystem services provided it's such a big question emma and it's and and that makes it really hard to answer i think because because um, there's so many ways to answer it and none of them really I, I feel like because there are so many different ways and it's so big um, none of them really do a good job of of telling us how biodiversity is connected with us but okay big picture um, you know nature and biodiversity support every aspect of human functioning and society so it's, it supports our well-being which we can talk more about in a minute it, it supports our economy and our culture and our history and um, you know our food and just our pharmaceutical industry um, you know it's, it's some Thing. It's about 40 to 50% of pharmaceuticals that are out on the market are um, directly derived from plants. You know, so if we lose the biodiversity of plants out there, then we are losing possible cures for human diseases. Um, you know, it supports our, our food industry and, and the resilience of the crops that we have. So we're facing a changing climate and increased droughts and um, changing weather patterns and increased um, fire and and, and floods and things and our crops need to be resilient to that and by losing if we lose genetic diversity and biodiversity of our plants then we lose the ability for those plants to become more resilient and, and um, build on that genetic diversity um, you know so the and, and it also contributes to the functioning of the ecosystems so you mentioned ecosystem services um, that's one way that humans think about the the benefits that we get from nature and the ways the many many ways that nature supports our our lives um, and biodiversity contributes to those ecosystems by making them resilient you know so you can think of a, a web um, you know a spider's web and when it has lots and lots of threads to it if you cut one thread it doesn't impact the whole web but if that's that web is really not very diverse and there's only five threads you cut one and, and it sort of falls apart um, so biodiversity yeah it just supports the functioning of ecosystems which in turn supports the functioning of all life on this planet <laughs> so i yeah i feel like it's it is it's a hard question to answer but you know fundamentally biodiversity um underpins all life on the on, on earth so let's bring it back a little bit closer to home then. Uh, we've had twice on our show, Dr. Corey Bradshaw, uh, well-established, <clears throat> excuse me, ecologist doing a lot of work in biodiversity conservation. He pretty much says it how it is, the situation in Australia, it's dire. From your perspective, what is the status in Australia? How's it looking? Yeah, so so actually, Corey was one of the first people we had on Science in the Pub Adelaide. Um, so I got to meet Corey that way back in back in Adelaide. Um, yeah, well, yeah, Corey would tell you it's not very good. We have you know one of the worst track records of biodiversity in the world, um, mm. and that's not entirely our our fault. It's 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 a function, and you would know in New Zealand, um, it's a function of being an island country and having so much um, so many diverse yeah diverse species. To begin with that are unique to these islands um so if they're gone from here they're gone from everywhere because this is the only place that they exist so that that's part of it is is just a function of where we are and, and being an island um, an island nation and um yeah what a what an impact invasive species and and environmental destruction can have on our biodiversity here so it's not good however um there's you know there there is a lot of yeah, there's a lot of interest in Australia in changing that and in protecting our our biodiversity, and that that occurs across all levels of of society and and government, which is which is really good. Lately, in particular, um, there has been some yeah a lot of a lot of movement in thinking about how we can reverse those dire trends that we've experienced over the last couple of decades and centuries here. So. Um, yeah, I'm getting to work with at the moment the National Environmental Science Program, which is one of the ways that the federal government funds research into um, environmental management. So, so they have these hubs. There are four hubs in the current National Environmental Science Program that are each 
responsible for understanding a um, yeah a topic of environmental conservation. So there's a, a climate systems hub, a, a marine um, marine and coastal systems hub, resilient landscapes, and then the one that I'm in, which is called sustainable communities and waste. And I, I get to co-lead a, a research theme in that hub called Sustainable People Environment Interactions. And this has been a really interesting um, role for me. It's a, it's yeah only been the last two years or so. And it's the first time I've got to sort of work with federal government and do research that's directly tied to policy and to, um, yeah, the way the decision making in, at the government level. Um, so we have Australia's strategy for nature is one of the main policy documents that informs how Australia should go about conserving and managing its environments. And the first goal of that major policy document is connecting all Australians with nature. And so there's a recognition that um, over the last couple of yeah, decades and centuries, a lot of humanity, especially in, in Western civilizations, have really departed, uh, lost our connection with nature, lost touch with nature, spend, we're spending less time outdoors, um, and we know less about nature than we used to. And there are repercussions of that. So it has impacts for our, our physical health and our mental health and the way we treat the environment. And so that's a, a, one of the major reasons that's the first goal of Australia's strategy for nature is because being more connected with nature tends to make people more willing to protect it and vote for strategies and people and parties that will protect it and will conserve it. And um, so, so I find that to be a promising thing um, that, you know, our, our major, uh, the major document that is guiding Australian management is, is recognizing the importance of reconnecting with nature. So that, that gives me a little seed of hope. Considering though that, I mean, you mentioned management before and considering that in the United Nations estimates that about two out of every three people will be living in cities or other urban areas by 2050, um, you know, given that the expanding urban environments are a major factor for biodiversity loss and habitat destruction and, you know, even climate change, how can cities start to manage biodiversity and nature exposure better as they continue to expand? Huge question. <laughs> yep, good question, especially in Australia where we're one of the most urbanized countries in the world. Um, yeah, it it is important. And yes, cities are basically defined by having less less nature and less greenery than the surrounding areas. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people can't connect with nature in those places. So some of the research uh, about nature connection is, shows that it, it, you don't have to be in a, you know, a wilderness area or a protected area or an old growth forest to be connecting with nature. A lot of people um, feel the, the greatest sense of place in their own home. Um, they connect with the nature that's um, directly around them. and you know, people do that through gardening, through observing the birds that come to their bird feeder um, or, or that fly over, the, over their backyard or walking to their local green space. So, you know, while, while cities have had a really negative impact on biodiversity and on our environment, they are also an important area for us to be managing nature and connecting with nature. So there's a lot of ways to do that. There's some really great urban greening programs around Australia. And there's a lot of efforts to um, plant more trees and to have more greenery that people can have access to. And, and there's, I, I think, um, a recognition of the importance of equity and how we do that. So making sure that it's not only the rich places that have trees and parks, that we um, make sure all, all Australians have access to quality environments where they can recreate. Um, because because of the clear and known benefits that that has for our well-being. Um, so yeah, it's it's not easy, but um, but urban greening is a good antidote to to the effects that cities have had on nature, and programs in cities that help people connect with local nature and the nature that's around them. Um, I, I think have a really important place in in achieving that 
that goal number one of Australia's strategy for nature, where we connect Australians with nature. A lot of effort is being put into the greening of urban centres, but as these urban centres grow, what's happening outside of those urban centres that then feeds back in is where the real biodiversity loss is occurring. Land clearing for livestock, uh, mining for minerals and and all sorts of energy, whether it's oil or, or whatever. So it's great that there's effort, and I think it's important from an urban planning point of view um, and improving lifestyle in urban, urban centres, but should there not be equally, if not even more effort being put into what's happening outside of those urban uh, centres? Because when you talk about equity, a lot of our more rural communities that might be more, even more closely, have more legacy, more closely connected to the land, they're being affected outside of those urban centres. So in terms of equity, we should be looking out, shouldn't we? Yeah, so it's a really good point. This is this is one of the sort of paradoxes of, of the benefits of nature um, is in Australia and in, in most developed nations, people in cities tend to have today anyway, higher um, health metrics than people living outside of cities. They live longer, they tend to have less less diseases. Um, you know, I, I I actually am curious how those metrics have 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 um, changed through COVID because you know high densities of people tends to contribute to transmission of infectious diseases. But but anyway, people in cities have access to better access to medical care. Um, they often have better access to social support systems may, and and better access to economics. So job opportunities and things that contribute to our well being. Though I think those three factors are the major ones that that are contributing to that disparity in health between urban and rural locations. So even though people living in rural and regional areas have supposedly more access to nature, um, they still have these worse health worse health metrics. So there are major trends that are contributing to that. That I mentioned, but there's also the question about na- access to nature and do people in regional and rural areas actually have better access to nature than people in cities? And that's a question that's worth um, exploring further because a lot of times people are living in, in somewhat degraded environments. They often don't have great access, so there's not pathways and, and sidewalks and places for them to get, at, ways for them to easily get out into nature. Um, and so that that also influences their ability to get those health and well-being benefits from nature because of the the infrastructure differences. Um, so I agree, and this is something that uh, we're wanting to explore at the moment. So I mentioned I'm working with the Sustainable Communities and Waste Hub, and our major project in that um, in our Sustainable People Environment Interactions theme is understanding nature connection in Australia and the benefits that people get from connecting with nature. So we have two two projects going on in that space. One is a national survey, and that's just gonna be asking people how they engage with nature, um, both asking them about their nature connection, how they engage with nature and connect with nature, both sort of cognitively and physically, um, and also understanding their well-being so that we can link those things and get to understand, you know, exactly what is it about engaging with nature? What is it about connecting with nature that is contributing to well-being or not um, for Australians? And how does that vary across states and across regional to rural um, to urban areas? So we are stratifying our the population that we're targeting with that survey so that we can compare across urban and, and rural and regional areas and across states um, and demographies in Australia. So that's something that we are trying to understand a little better through that survey. And also the other project we have going on is as a storytelling project. So the Nature Connection Storytelling Project. And that's just using a a different approach to understand the ways that people uh, connect with nature and what benefits they experience from doing so. Um, And, you know, between those two projects, I think we can get a better sense of what nature connection looks like in Australia and how that varies across the landscape um, and the benefits people get from doing so. What do you think are some of the key pathways at play to explain the health improvements derived from time in nature? Yeah, um, so there's some really, it's a good question and there's some really good work in this space. I think it's helpful to think about what do we mean by health and well-being? So I sometimes 
talk about multifaceted well-being. Um, and there's lots of different ways that people conceptualize that. But the major components are, I would say, our physical health, our mental health, our cognitive well-being, and our social connections and social well-being. And so those four components are, are pretty major. There are sometimes other ones that people put in there, um, like economic well-being or financial well-being, um, spiritual well-being, uh, environmental well-being, talking about how healthy the environment around you is and how that contributes to your well-being. But, you know, I think the important thing is that there are many facets and components of what we call our well-being. Um, sometimes people equate the well-being with our quality of life. It's another way of describing it, how, how satisfied are we, how happy are we with our life. Um, but nature can contribute, you know, the, the pathways or mechanisms through which nature supports our well-being varies depending on which facet of well-being we're talking about. So, um, yeah, so being out in nature allows us an opportunity to recreate. So a lot of times the way we are in nature and what we do in nature um, is phys physically active, is being physically active. We go for a walk, we go for a run or a, a mountain bike or um, getting, getting out gets us physically active. So that's one way that nature supports our physical health. Um, it, the, the mechanisms through which it supports our mental health, I think the mechanisms part is a little harder to, to describe, but for many of us, it, it, it is, um, something we've experienced and there's lots of evidence showing how it does improve our mood. It reduces our stress. It reduces depression and anxiety. Um, and so it's, it can contribute to our mental health that way. The cognitive health part, there's, um, something called attention restoration theory, where if you are looking at things, it's called having soft fascination. So like you're not concentrating, but your attention is held by something. Um, it just helps restore our ability to think clearly our ability to to process and focus and yeah there's lots of lots of evidence of how especially for um, school children how some time in nature can improve their ability to learn and to focus in school um, and there's been work on that for adults in the workplace as well um, and it contributes to our social well-being because a lot of what we do out in nature is with spending time with other people. So you think about your local green space and people go there to have their play sports and have barbecues and picnics and um, ha as a place to meet up with others. So yeah, so it, it contributes in many ways and it depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it, but those are sort of the four main main pathways. I do, I have, I have talked about the microbial pathway as well. That's something that I've done a little bit of research on in um yeah in my career which is a, a sort of emerging and interesting uh component so we all yeah we know now about our own microbiome or the bacteria bacterial communities that live in our, on and in our bodies so we often think about the gut microbiome but we have microbiomes of our skin and our eyes and our hair and and all of that so the gut microbiome we know is important for many many pathways of our own of well-being but there's the gut brain axis it's related to our mood and our um how we feel and how we process foods and how how much calories and fat we extract from food so it it's it, it influences our immune system so in so many different ways it's impacting our well-being um so most people have heard of that part that our microbiome is an important aspect of our health but what we now know is that a lot of that microbiome is shared with the environment. So we get our microbiome, those microbes from foods that we eat, from you know breastfeeding as, a, as an infant and, and having someone give birth to us as an infant. Um, it gets seeded that way and it gets influenced by, um, yeah, the microbes that we're breathing in, that we're eating on our food and, and all of those things. So, so there's been some evidence that exposure to biodiverse microbial communities, especially early on, um, in the life course before the age of two or so, um, that that impacts the way our immune system develops and our likelihood of getting allergies and asthma and things. So that's another, you know, aspect, a potential benefit we can get from exposure to biodiverse environments is exposure to biodiverse microbial communities. Before the age of two, does that mean put a, uh, a baby in a, in a pile of dirt or does that mean more than that? <laughs> <sighs> 
The answer, as stop. with so much <laughs> in, <laughs> in health and in well-being and in ecology, is it's complicated. So, mm. yeah, I don't know. I mean, the evidence is, so growing up on a farm has for a long time uh, and in many different ways been shown to be uh, associated negatively associated with allergies and asthma. So if you live on a farm, you are less likely to have those things. Um, and as mm. they've explored into that a little bit more, it looks like that exposure to diverse microbial communities is a large part rather than, you know, diet or, um, you know, exposure to heavy metals or anything like that. It, it's, it really looks like there's that close link with what microbes you're exposed to mm. as far as how your immune system develops and how likely it is to um, recognize, be able to distinguish between harmful pathogens, well, harmful um, proteins and non-harmful ones. And that's sort of, you know, what allergies are all about. We, we misunderstand our bodies, misunderstanding harmless um, proteins or antigens as being harmful and it's attacking them. So if your immune system is exposed to a diversity of microbes, the idea is that it, it learns to distinguish the good from the bad from an early age. But it's not that easy, of course, because, you know, exposure to greater diversity can also mean exposure to lots of bad pathogens. There are lots of bad pathogens right. in the environment. There's anthrax in our soil. You know, <laughs> you don't want that. Um, so, so yeah, there's, it's, there's, there is inherent risk in exposure to biodiversity. And I think that we shouldn't pretend that that's not there. I don't think we should whitewash over that. There is inherent risk. Um, but on the you know, wholesale, our understanding is that it's it's better for us to be exposed to that diversity than it is to be to try to avoid it. So speaking of washing over, a different way of asking the same question, are we living in an over sanitized society? Um, Especially post COVID spray bottles, wet wipes, wash your hands 20 times a day. Yeah. Yeah. So the appropriate approach to how sanitary do we want to be is going to depend on the the risks of the environment right so if you're living in a um if you're working in a hospital covid ward i would say you sanitize and protect as much as is humanly possible right um but do we is is that the right approach all the time i would say no you know the evidence tells us that exposure to biodiversity is good for us um, and small amounts of exposure to even pathogens can immunize us. So that's one of the ways our immune system learns, what is this pathogen? It makes antibodies that then survive for long periods of time. And if you see that pathogen again, you can attack it and be healthy um, because your immune system has, has gotten rid of that infection. So, so over sanitizing can be bad. Under sanitizing mm -hmm. can also be bad. Um, and the, you so know, we can hold on to the handrail of an escalator. You it's can. Not that bad then. My approach, <laughs> my approach is if you're in a place where there's lots of other people who all share the same sort of pathogens as you, it's probably good to wash your hands. So going through airports after holding the handrail at the at the small of America or whatever, where there's hundreds of thousands of people, I'd wash my hands mm -hmm. as often as you can. But if you're out out in the environment, you know, you're going for a walk. I think that's where you get, you know, exposure to diversity and exposure mm -hmm. to small amounts of things. And that is what helps our immune system learn good from bad and, and um, protect us. So I would say that's, you know, it's all, it's all in a balance, right? The important point I always try to make here is that, yes, while I think that we have, we have over sterilized human society a bit um, and we're kind of afraid of going outdoors and of germs and things and, and I think there are definitely drawbacks of that. Sanitation is definitely one of the best inventions that humans have ever had. You know, having sewage systems, having soap, having vaccines, being able to, um, you know, per kill the bad bacteria and viruses and, and protect ourselves from them is one of the best inventions humans have ever had. Living a couple hundred years ago was pretty terrible. so. Yeah, hygiene is a good thing, um, but like all good things, you can take it too far. We just had, you know, we had Easter the other day and had some friends over and had a wonderful time. The kids were watching a movie and eating chocolate in the other room. One of the girl, little girls came in to her, the parents and puked all over us. Chocolate <laughs> spew everywhere. 
So chocolate's a wonderful oh. thing, but you can overdo it. And the same is true of sanitation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> yeah. I think we've all been there. You can overdo good things. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. You've also done some really interesting research around ecological restoration programs, um, particularly more recently in rural settings. So we've already kind of discussed that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if you live in the country, you're exposed to green space, et cetera, but it's not always accessible. Um, but I suppose you could still argue that you'd at least be seeing more green spaces, for example, than a city dweller. Um, but what did your research find? Were there benefits for participants living rurally to get involved in these kinds of programs? Yeah, so that was just a really wonderful project to be involved with. So it was led by a colleague of mine here at UTAS, uh, Pauline Marsh, and um, collaborated with a not-for-profit in the northeast of Tasmania um, called the Northeast Bioregional Network that's run by Todd Dudley, who's an absolute legend of conservation up in that part of the world. So Todd has been running ecological restoration programs for the last 20 or 30 years for a long time. And sometimes that work, sometimes he's able to um, pay people to do ecological restoration work. Sometimes it's volunteer based because there's nowhere near enough funding for conservation um, and restoration in Tasmania and you know, generally the world, I would say. Um, but he's, you know, ex observed a lot of benefits for the people doing the work, whether, you know, e even when it's volunteer based, people are, are talking about what a great impact it's had on them to do the work, um, doing the planting and, and uh, restoration work. So he wanted our help um, to do some research to understand what are those benefits and really to try to capture that and understand um, benefits that, that people were experiencing. So we took a qualitative research approach to that question and went up and interviewed um, ecological restoration workers who had worked with Todd for various periods of time. And we also interviewed some local healthcare workers to understand their views on the possible well-being benefits of doing that type of work and, and how those things might be connected. And what we, what we heard from the ecological restoration workers um, was just, it, it was incredible. This is my, this was my first foray into quantitative research, or qualitative, sorry. My background is mostly quantitative where I work with, you know, numbers and, um, you know, epidemiology and things, but this was getting to talk to people and then understand the themes of their, um, what they had said. And it just was so memorable. I mean, yeah, people described so many different well-being benefits. So some people had addiction problems and said that doing that work um, helped them um, drink less alcohol. People talked about the mental health benefits that they, you know, had had mental health problems. And while they were doing that work, they felt better. Uh, they were getting out of the house more. They had improved physical fitness because they were out working in the landscape, walking up and down hills. Um, they had they talked about self-esteem and pride and being able to see the changes that they had created in the landscape and knowing that those would last for generations. Um, yeah, it was really impactful for them. Um, feelings of hope and positivity and having social connections and, and really feeling part of a, a team and being part of a part of that workforce. And, um, yeah, so so really diverse. Talking, looking back at those um, different components of well-being: physical health, mental health, cognitive health. They talked about the, the value of learning about the plants and what was invasive and what wasn't, and how to manage a landscape, um, and and how you know getting chainsaw certification and, and just you know the value of the learning for them and and having that um, that contributing to their self-esteem as well. So so contributing in a really holistic and multifaceted way to their well-being when it was paid work um also contributing to their financial stability and um and sense of sense of worth and self of sense of pride through through having that paid work so this this project was done it's a it's a regional area of tasmania it's got like so many um regional rural areas across the world much lower health and education metrics um lower um economic you know, income and, and all of those metrics that you measure for how well is a community doing, this area is, you know, is scoring low and in, in all those things. And so we said this, this type of project where people are being involved uh, in, in 
improving the landscape and doing restoration, it benefits the environment, obviously. That's, that's, why, that's why the program exists. But look at all these incredible multifaceted benefits that it's having for the well-being, well-being of these individuals as well. So especially when these projects can be funded, when those people are having an income and making some money doing this work, it, it just can be such a win-win for these, these regional areas. Um, yeah, but the it, it, an important caveat is that it's it, it's not that easy. You don't just throw people out and say, "Here, go do some restoration. It'll benefit the environment, and you'll feel better." There has to be really intentional design of that program so that those benefits can be can be felt. So when Todd was able, when he had funding and was able to pay people, he he paid them well. Um, and paid them for a shorter, or paid them in a way where they could work less hours of the day because restoration work is physically demanding. You're out in all types of weather, you're walking up and down hills, you're using chainsaws, you're digging things out of the, out of the ground and cutting down invasive species. Like it's physically demanding and it's really easy for that to turn into burnout, um, whether people are paid or, or unpaid. So, so Todd's just really been very thoughtful in the way that he goes about um, involving people in that work and creates such an inclusive culture, um, recognizing people's um, ability levels and, and what they're able to do at a given time and working around that so that they can contribute in the way that they're able to, um, you know, rotating people so they have are exposed to diverse um, tasks so they're not doing the same thing over and over and getting sick of it. You know, and just really fostering that that connection and, and positive, inclusive social environment for people. So, so yeah, there, there's great potential for this type of program to have benefits for regional and rural communities um, and and environments. But it, yeah, it's it's um, it needs to be done intentionally and thoughtfully um, to create a really nice um, co-benefiting program. Grounded hope is a concept that we we often refer to in, in, in a lot of our episodes and it couldn't be any truer than getting involved in restorative work and there's a lot of wonderful restorative programs out there uh, for people to sign up to get involved with this well generally they're voluntary and and a few odd opportunities to, to actually earn a little bit from it too from an individual point of view so this podcast is all about inspiring people to take action to get out there and and do Take a little bit of action to, to, to bring about a small bit of change. From an individual point of view, what would your advice be? What can we, you know, other than joining other entities, what could we do as individuals that can benefit our environment? We've established it's important, healthy planet, healthy people. What can we start doing in our own backyard? Well, you can start with your own backyard. Um, it's a good place to start. So as Emma mentioned, I I teach a unit called Backyard Biodiversity. And that unit's all about learning about the biodiversity of your yard um, and why biodiversity matter matters within a sustainable development goals framework. Um, and and it hope, the hope is that it's giving people the skills and knowledge to make their backyard more biodiverse. Um, so you can take that approach. So, you know, the majority of land in, in urban areas is privately owned. So if all people are influencing their own sphere of control, their own backyards, um, that can make a huge change to, to the landscape. So that's one approach you can take. You know, you, um, we talked about outdoor spending time outside and what we like to do on our own. I trail run and um, that makes me feel healthy and feel connected to the environment. And so getting out into nature in whatever way um, is best for you is something you know, I also think is something within our own sphere of control that we can all do. Um, to me, the other important one is learning about your, your natural environment, your place, your local area. So um, there's a, a Native American scholar called Robin Kimmerer from the U.S., um, and she's written some incredible books and papers and things. But um, the two books are Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering Moss. Uh, and she's a, a plant biologist. She researches plants and teaches about them and, and writes. And one of the things she says, I think it's in Braiding Sweetgrass, is that it's a sign of respect to learn a name, right? So if you're, you're working with people, if you learn their name, um, that's a sign of respect. And if you use that, that helps you build a relationship with that person. 
The same is true for nature. So if we learn the names of the plants and animals around us, we start to build a closer relationship with them. And if you take, you know, that, and that's the first step is learning the name. The next step is learning more about them, right? So if we, um, again, with people, you learn the name, but if you can say, oh, how are the kids doing? How's the dog? Is he, you know, over his, he was sick last time, or, oh, you're taking the boat out to go fishing this weekend. Or if you can talk to them about their life, that's another way of building a deeper connection with that person. Same, same is true for, um, for the rest of the life around us. So if we learn its name, plants and animals, and we learn about it, we can better build a relationship. And, um, you know, what Robin Kimmerer talks about in her books is the importance of a reciprocal relationship, which is something that indigenous cultures around the world, um, uh, embody or, or, um, have as part of their, their relationship with the world is that it's reciprocal. So it's a give and take. And a lot of Western societies, I feel, have forgotten the give part, that it's just about taking from nature and quantifying nature and seeing what it can do for us and um, how it can support us. And we've forgotten that we need to give back. And so if you learn about the plants and animals around you, we're better able to develop that reciprocity and better able to give back. At this, before we started the recording, you said you had listened to a few episodes and thought, how do people talk for an hour? I'll tell I you what, say that. we've been here for an hour. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the clock. I was like, oh my gosh, I am going to talk for that long. Lots to talk about. And we could, mm. we could go on and on, but you do have kids to pick up from school. Because um, you can't leave them out in the dark alone. Um, well, they don't like that. Not these days. <laughs> no. Uh, but Emily, thank you so much. It's been hugely inspiring, um, this conversation. So much learned. And it's such a simple thing. You know, I think the last thing you've mentioned now is, is getting to learn more about our environment. And we're out there. And, and this is why the Athletes for Nature campaign is all about, whereas athletes, we are out in nature. Sometimes... A lot, a lot of time, you know, long days sometimes. And use that time, get to know your environment. And, and we're in a place that it's our playground. And we should also understand what's impacting, not just learning about the environment, but what it's actually impacting it. And once we understand what's impacting, then we know where to start taking action to protect that environment, which gives so much back to our own well-being. So you've given us so many gold little nuggets about where we should start learning. Um, just don't go mining those nuggets. That causes, yeah, we're just going to go down a rabbit hole with that. Uh, right. But no, thank you so much for the amazing work you do. Hugely inspiring. And we really, really appreciate your time to come onto the show. So thank you. Thanks, Ben and Emma. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends.